there was a uh, a researcher out at, at Harvard University, School of Public Health. His name is Mark Hegstead. And Mark Hegstead uh, devised something called the Hegstead Equation, looking at dietary fats for predicting heart disease risk. And, and he worked at the uh, USDA Center for Human Nutrition, helping create dietary guidelines for Americans. And he was a bit of a giant in the world of nutrition. He was a professor of nutrition at Harvard. And he was really interested in calcium and osteoporosis epidemiology. And late in his career, he said something that really resonated with me. He said, it will be embarrassing enough if the current calcium hype is useless. But it will be immeasurably worse if the recommendations are detrimental to health. So how could our preoccupation with calcium derived from cow's milk possibly prove detrimental to our health? That's what I want to show you now. Because of our determination to be good students of the dairy industry's teachings, we have gobbled up all of the milk that we can, and all of the yogurt, and all of the cheese, and the ice cream, and we felt good about this, right? We're following the advice, we're compliant, we're doing what we're told. But in the process of doing so, we are unwittingly exposing ourselves to hormones and growth factors. Because they don't tell you that on the milk carton. And hormones, we hear a lot about these days, don't we? We hear about athletes taking hormones. We hear about postmenopausal women taking hormone replacement therapy. And now we even hear about men. We hear about men taking human growth hormone to reclaim their youth and vitality. But what are they? What are these substances? Well, hormones are chemical messengers, and they travel throughout the body. They're released by a variety of endocrine glands, and they exert their effect on various target tissues. These are tissues that have receptors for them. And you can think of a receptor and a hormone as sort of a lock and key system. So you have this hormone molecule that goes into the receptor and activates a whole cascade of events in the body. We've learned that hormones are responsible for so many things, uh, uh, growth, reproduction, metabolism, even mood, among many other things. But we know that the body wants to keep hormones in a very delicate balance. And when they get out of balance, the likelihood of disease goes up. So to give you an idea... Imagine an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We'll drain it of water and fill it with lime juice. And then we'll take an eyedropper and we'll drop one drop of tequila in there. We'll have the world's biggest margarita. A weak one, albeit. That's one part per trillion. That's the ratio at which hormones work in our body. Tiny levels. So I want to talk to you about two diseases. These are two diseases that everyone in this room will have been touched by in some way. And that's because the incidence of these diseases has gone up so substantially over the last few decades that it seems every one of us, one of us has been touched. It may be that you've had a personal diagnosis or a loved one, a friend, a colleague, a coworker. I'm talking about breast cancer and prostate cancer. And I want to begin by talking about breast cancer. Breast cancer now strikes one in eight women in their lifetime in North America. And if you look at all the conventionally accepted risk factors for breast cancer, I'm talking about early menarche, late menopause, earlier uh, 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 late pregnancy or not having pregnancy, not breastfeeding, uh, use of alcohol, use of hormone replacement therapy. All of these things come back to one thing. There's a common thread that runs, runs through them all, and it's, it's your cumulative lifetime exposure to estrogen. And that's what the experts will tell you. They'll say it's about your total exposure to estrogen that we have the biggest concern. And that's not to say that all the breast cancer that we see is estrogen driven, because it's not. Just the lion's share. So if what they're saying is we need to minimize our exposure to estrogen if we can, other than those risk factors that I just mentioned to you, how else can we do so? Well, diet is a very powerful way. Diet has an influence on the hormone economy in the body. And in this regard, we have learned that women who eat a high fat diet, have much higher levels of estrogen than women who have a low-fat diet. And we've learned that 
uh, fiber is essential to hormone balance in the body because after the bodies use the hormones for one reason or another, they're bound to fiber and excreted from the body. But in the absence of adequate fiber, they can be reabsorbed and elevate hormone levels. So we know that if we put women on a high-fiber, low-fat diet, as UCLA researchers did, and we measure their estrogen levels at baseline, and then we track them over a period of weeks, something happens. Their estrogen levels plummet. Very interesting. And after a couple of weeks, we're talking about a 37% drop in the last study I, study I saw. I mean, that's impressive. So how else can we affect our exposure to estrogen? Well, milk, cow's milk. Because cow's milk is the source from which you will get 80% of all the exogenous estrogen in your life. That is the estrogen from outside your body. Number one source. But they don't tell you that. Nobody tells you that. And we do something in this country that compounds the problem because other dairy nations don't do this. They know better. We, we want to get as much milk from these animals as we possibly can. And so... We milk them about 330 days a year, right through their pregnancy. We keep them in a constant uh, cycle of lactation. As soon as they give birth, we're artificially inseminating them again because you know dairy cows don't produce milk just because they're a dairy cow. They have to be impregnated. And that's how they make milk. So what happens is, as a pregnancy advances, the milk changes with regard to the amount of estrogen that's in it and other hormones, such that if you have a cow who gives birth and you take some of her milk and put it in a glass, and then you have another cow who you're milking through late stage, maybe the end of the third trimester of her pregnancy, and you put that in a glass and you compare them, this cow's milk has up to 33 times more estrogen in it than this cow's. And they don't tell you that. They say, have another glass. Have some more cheese. Have some more yogurt. So there's another thing I want to tell you about milk, and it's called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. You've probably heard about it. It gets a lot of attention these days because we know that people who maintain the highest levels of IGF-1 have a substantially elevated risk of developing breast, colon, and prostate cancer compared to those who maintain the lowest levels. And... With regard to breast cancer, we've seen that women who are postmenopausal, who have the highest IGF-1 levels, have about a three times elevated risk of developing the disease compared to those with the lowest levels. But if you're premenopausal, the risk can be up to sevenfold higher in those who have the highest levels. So why is that? Well, IGF-1 is interesting. It's uh, we have it in our bodies at the highest levels during puberty. It acts on the breast tissue in young women. And uh, it tapers off around 17, 18 in young women and in young men around 19, 20. And it'll never be that high again. But IGF-1 is produced by cows. It's just like our IGF-1. So when we drink cow's milk, we drink the IGF-1, and our IGF-1 levels go up. And why is this significant? Well, IGF-1 is not the thing you want to have in high amounts on your team if your interest is in preventing cancer. And here's why. There are certain attributes to IGF-1 that, you, uh, that are not uh, supportive of cancer prevention. First, it's a mitogen, so it uh, promotes cell division, and unregulated cell division is the central theme in cancer. Uh, it promotes malignancy. Uh, it is uh, required for tumor formation. And it promotes metastasis. You know what metastatic cancer is? You can have a localized cancer, and these days, you know, we do fairly well by excising a cancer and sewing people up and sending them on their way. Survival rates are pretty good. But it's metastatic cancers when the cancer colonizes other organs and you have multiple cancer sites. That's when things get complicated, and that's the cancer more often than not that kills. IGF-1 promotes that. And then IGF-1 interferes with something else called apoptosis, which is something that's going on all the time in the body. You have a rogue cell that's damaged, getting out of control, could lead down the road to the cancer cascade. 
It self-extinguishes. Some people call it cell, cell suicide. Eliminates itself, which is a great thing. We need that. Well, IGF-1 inhibits that process. So this is not uh, a friend. This is a foe in this regard. And there are a couple of things that we're doing that are complicating the problem with our exposure to IGF-1. The first is, some years back, dairy farmers noticed that certain cows produced more milk for the same amount of feed. So they started to look into it, trying to understand why. And they found that certain cows, just because of their genetics, they made more IGF-1. And that led to more milk. So more bang for the buck. For the same amount of feed, you're getting more milk. So they said, hey, this is pretty interesting. What if all our cows were high IGF-1 producers? That would be cool. Well, if you're in the business of selling milk, that might be. But if you're in the business of drinking it, it's not. So what they did was they started breeding their dairy herds to favor the high IGF-1 producers. And over time, these herds became populated with high IGF-1 producing cows. So we already got this elevation in IGF-1 due to that. And then, of course, somebody came along and said, hey, have I got a product for you? Just put this needle in the rear end of your cow and shoot this stuff in, and they're going to make even more milk. And, of course, the dairy industry was attracted to that idea. More milk. We always want more milk. And so they jumped on the bandwagon and started using recombinant bovine growth hormone. Well, how does RBGH make a cow produce more milk? Anybody have any ideas? Boosts IGF-1 production. So now you've got a double whammy. You've got them bred to favor high IGF-1. You've got this, this genetically engineered product that is causing, causing them to produce more IGF-1. And I've talked to you about the, the risks associated with breast cancer. 